others wanting to make them just a little bit better. Working, planning, dreaming. Gonna make my home where the wabash flows and the primrose and the violet grows. Gonna make my home where the Wabash River flows. Gonna make my home by the river shore. Gonna settle down forevermore. Gonna make my home where the Wabash River flows. Girl, I left behind me. She'll be sorry by and by, but she'll come up running after me with the love light in her. Gonna make our home where the wabash flows and the primrose and the violet grows. Gonna make our home where the wabash river flows. Always singing that song, Danny. Let's do it, Ma. Let's do it right off. Do what? Let's go out there. Out across the mountain. Find us a place get some land. Always dreaming. Just like your pa. Other people are doing it. Why us? Wouldn't you like that, Ma? Wouldn't you like to have things? I got a lot to be thankful for now, Danny. Boy who's just like his pa, always wanting to get off. Now, if you'll say the word, we'll go west. Gonna make my home where the wabash flows and the primrose and the violet grows. Gonna make my home where the wabash river flows. That was the spirit folks had when they opened up the land. Folks hankering to be somebody, have things they could call their own and be proud of. Feeling that way, they cleared the land and planted it to crops. The women folk helped in the fields, spun and toiled. They got on. Lean-tos gave way to log cabins. Log cabins to houses of brick and stone. The wilderness disappeared. All the good things we see around us today are products of that pioneer spirit. That house your pa built where you were born. Little businesses that have grown into big ones. Towns and cities that are good to live in. We've kept right on forging ahead, this country has, because it's a place where one man, any man, can do things on his own. I've got a personal pride in one little chapter of our American story, and not such a little chapter at that when you come to think about it. All my life I've worked for the railroad, and railroads, believe you me, grew up the American way. Wasn't much in this part of the country to make anybody want to build a railroad when some get-up-and-go Hoosiers started this one. Weren't enough people in this whole territory then to fill up a fair-sized county today. Land was mostly the way nature made it. A whole lot of this United States was like that back in 1846 and thereabouts. Fact is, it was only beginning to look like the United States as we know it today. Less than 50 years had gone by since the original 13 states started to spread out. Texas was just getting into the Union and the Oregon country. Here in this middle part of the land, Congress had set up what they called Northwest Territory. Then as settlers began to fill up parts of it, they cut it up into territories and states. Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana. It was down here in southern Indiana along the Ohio River that the folks I spoke about began to build the railroad. There wasn't any very good way to haul things once you got away from the river. That's what kept the country from developing faster, depending on river boats, a few roads and canals. These weren't enough. 
And some far-sighted folks knew they weren't. Folks like James Brooks of New Albany, Indiana. There isn't any reason in the world for doubting this, gentlemen. Railroads are being built in the East, and not by dreamers either. They're being built by sound businessmen because they have seen that the iron rail and the steam locomotive are the real answers to long distance hauling. I'd rather stick to canal. We know what they'll do. Oh, you can't build a canal over the knobs. There's too much rough country between here and the White River. The state's already poured a lot of money into the Macadam roads. Let's finish them. Wagons, even on the best of roads, will never haul a pittance of the stuff we could haul on rails. I say, let's take over some of this right of way that's been graded. As the new law has made it possible to, and let's put rails on the right of way. Railroads, gentlemen, are the answer. Men like James Brooks carried their point. Railroads were built, and the people took to them. They shipped their goods over them. They wanted to ride the trains whenever they could. Hooray for the Kiars! Oh, it's fun to go riding and riding and riding along on the passenger cars. It's exciting, 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 like floating along on the stars. Oh, it's fun to go riding and riding and riding, no journey would ever seem long. When the wheels clicked in rhythm, my heart is in rhythm. took to the railroads, and a lot of them were built, but it was a big job. Take this line that James Brooks and his friends began in Indiana, for example. They tackled only 30 miles or so of it at first. Um, they began down here in, uh, eh, and went on up to Salem. <laughs> Matter of fact, they called it New Albany and Salem. But they had bigger ideas than that. They got themselves a charter which allowed them to go any place in Indiana. So by 1852, they got up here to Orleans. Not very far, you might say, but it was hard going. Then some other folks took a hand. At uh, Crawfordsville, they decided to build a railroad to hook up with the Wabash and Erie Canal at Lafayette. Indiana's only Lake Michigan port. Main trouble they had with the whole thing was money. It didn't grow on bushes in those days or on Washington cherry trees either. By the time the railroad got to Lafayette, it was out of money. And that's where Hoosier ingenuity took over. And that's where this roving charter came in mighty handy. They loaned out the charter to John Murray Forbes of Boston. Couldn't get a charter from the Indiana legislature. And who was set on pushing his Michigan Central Railroad on into Chicago here, ahead of its rival, the Lakeshore. Well, a half million dollars in stock subscriptions the New Albany and Salem got from that transaction. Enough money to finish the railroad from Lafayette to the lake. You couldn't beat men like that. They were building Indiana. They built this nation big and strong. Work away, work away. Oh, 
we've been doing, haven't we? That's what we've been doing for a lot of years. I don't claim much for my part, it's, but gosh, when you think of all our American efforts together, mm-hmm. <laughs> I've gone and talked till it's time for the Hoosier to come in. I've got to go now. Say, how about you taking a ride up and down the Mona? See for yourself how she's still helping her part of America to roll along. I can't go with you, but the boys on the train will take good care of you. Up and down the Mona, everything is fine. Cause that root and toot and Mona, she's a whole All up and down the line, you can see how the railroad has helped to create American prosperity. Farms producing great quantities of never be fully marketed without modern mass transportation. Factories which assemble their raw materials from a lot of far-flung points and send their finished products everywhere. Towns and cities in which people have grown used to buying things which are brought from all over the world. Our way of life, which is literally a product of railroads at work. Take these factories which make prefabricated houses. Their lumber comes from as far away as the Deep South and the Pacific Northwest. Their steel begins as iron ore from the Minnesota Range, ore which is converted in some of the world's largest mills located in northern Indiana. Countless other items have to be shipped in this from hundreds of different places in order that one complete house can roll off the assembly line. All up and down the railroads of America, this miracle is repeated and repeated. Railroads are not the only transportation used, of course, but because of their tremendous capacity, their unfailing reliability, and their basic economy, they are the backbone of American industry and American agriculture. Railroads like the Monon help out the territories they serve in other ways, too. These great steel highways not only link the communities together, thus helping to create wealth, they distribute much of their income in the communities they serve. Every time a train like this, the railroad will spend $10.02 on the labor and materials to operate the train, maintain the tracks, pay taxes, and other costs. Each mile represents an investment of nearly $100,000 and costs nearly $6,000 per year to maintain. This length of steel rail costs the railroad over $70 when laid. Each one of these new ties will cost more than $4 when placed in the track. Even the lowly spike carries a price tag of nearly five cents. The Monon has to haul a ton of freight three miles in order to earn five cents. Work like this creates big payrolls, payrolls which are spent in cities along the line. Taxes take a large part of it, too. Taxes consume more than half of the revenue which is left after other expenses have been paid. Every mile of track which this train traverses pays an average annual tax to the county, state, and federal governments of $2,163. Taxes paid by the railroads go to maintain the public schools and to provide other essential services in the community. In many counties, more than half of all the local taxes are paid by the railroads. And on a national basis, the railroads pay out four times as much in taxes as they do in dividends to their stockholders. No other form of transportation makes any such contribution to the area it serves. 
This Indiana, which the Monon has helped to build, is quite a place. It's a place that's fabled in story and in song. Many are the wonders that are lovely to behold. Oh, nature does her handiwork right well. Lakes and rills and temple hills, this land of ours and foes. But in one spot, my fondest memories dwell. There's a little bit of paradise that all the world should know. It's the shades of Indiana Where the sweetest flowers grow And the softest breezes blow And there's magic as the seasons come and go There's a little bit of paradise I long again to roam It's the shades of Indiana how I long to sneak down Sugar Creek Like barefoot boy with tan on cheek And my Spring Mill, the dunes, they're all part of the great picture which the good Lord painted in Indiana and which Hoosiers have tried to preserve and throw open for the enjoyment of everybody. Take a look at the towns and cities in Indiana, too. They're alert, progressive, forward-moving, full of good, sound enterprise. And they're homey and friendly, Hoosier towns, with all that that folksy term implies. Even the big industrialized places like Indianapolis, the capital, are Hoosier right down to the roots. All of its factories, its varied business enterprises, haven't robbed Indianapolis of that friendly atmosphere which prompted a famous Hoosier poet to call the city High Heaven, Soul, and Only Understudy. Monument Circle, which is the city's most distinguishing landmark, typifies this survival of the neighborly spirit which is so apparent throughout the Hoosier state. Indianapolis, too, is the scene of one of the world's great annual sports events, the 500-mile Memorial Day race. Each year since 1909, America's most daring drivers have piloted their mechanical steeds around this great proving ground for the automotive industry. And in these grueling contests, have tested nearly all of the new developments in automobile engineering. For years, the Monon has helped to bring in the countless thousands who descended on Indianapolis for this event, transported them in an atmosphere of real Hoosier hospitality on its famous Chicago-Indianapolis train, the Hoosier. Hoosier time, Hoosier time, we run this railroad ride on Hoosier time, Hoosier time, Hoosier time, there never ever was a better time. Hoosier time, where every golden moment is a time for joy and laughter. Hoosier time, Hoosier time, it's a bell. Hoosier towns, American towns, towns where industry and thrift and independent initiative are admired and rewarded. 
good towns in which to locate factories. The whole state of Indiana has an enviable record of friendly relations between management and labor and government. State and local taxes are extremely favorable to business. Transportation facilities and power resources are unexcelled. That Hoosier air is healthy for business. Hoosier time. We run this railroad right on Hoosier time. Hoosier time. The present management of the Monon has been extremely progressive in its efforts to provide its online communities with the finest in transportation service and equipment. The Monon was the first Class I railroad to become completely dieselized. Centralized servicing facilities with every modern device for maintaining equipment and expediting repairs ensure dependable schedules. Diesel power in all switching operations means smooth handling of cars, minimum breakage or damage to shipments. Along the railroad, vast improvements have been made. Miles of new track have been laid. Lines have been shortened and straightened. Bridges have been strengthened. Some have been completely rebuilt. Signal systems are being continually improved. New interlockers installed to increase speed of train movement. Oh, up and down the Monon, everything is fine on that route. All points on the Monon are now connected by dependable overnight freight service. To expedite interline movements, schedules are arranged so that they integrate efficiently with the schedules of connecting lines. This is especially important when it is recalled how many major railroads intersect the Monon and how strategically located the railroad is as a bridge line between its great terminals of Chicago, Indianapolis, and Louisville. Although Monon's trackage is primarily in Indiana and it is known as the Hoosier Line, the railroad is intimately connected with the commercial and industrial life of its great terminal cities in Kentucky and in Illinois. Louisville, the fall city, key spot in the early winning of the West, hub of a great business area. You've been in Louisville at Derby time, no doubt, or you're planning to go sometime. Come see Louisville, see the Derby, and all the other great attractions this city has to offer. town. And Chicago, railroad center of the nation, the Monon's northern terminus. Chicago, brief history as the story of civilization goes, 
but world capital of many things. There's a rainbow in Chicago on our boats are riding high. There's a rainbow over Chicago. There's a great tomorrow written in the sky. There's a dream come true for Chicago, and the dream will never die. There's a blue sky showing you like glowing. There's a rainbow. Chicago, Indianapolis, Louisville. The Monon links together these three great cities, supposed to find communities in between. Monon intersects the important east-west arteries in its part of the land and serves as a great railway bridge between Lake Michigan and the Ohio River. The Monon is proud of its place on the railroad map, proud that it has helped the heart of America to grow and to prosper. Proud that it is kept pick, proud that it's the Hoosier line. Because it's Hoosier soil the Monon is put in. The Hoosier Commonwealth it has helped to build. Have a nice trip up and down. Mom. All of us on the railroad hope you did. We hope you like this Monon country as much as we do. We hope you saw how the Monon means something to you. Whether you live in Indiana or some far away part of the country. We think that the Monon means something to you. We think it means better handling of your transportation problems. Better travel when you come into or go through Indiana. Faster service for your shipments through this crossroads of America. One thing we're sure you will agree with us on. This America of ours is the greatest place on earth. And the one thing above all else that makes it is the fact that so many individuals had a hand in building it up. That secret in a nutshell, individual initiative. That's why every one of us can be so proud of his own corner of America. That's why I'm so proud of the Monon and of Indiana. That's why those boys down at Purdue, when they sing, There's something about the air in Indiana. 